got to meet his friends. As a result of that, I got invited back to teach in a, one of the grad courses thingies and uh, met Dr. Olson, met Matt. And I don't forget which one, but we met. And uh, God's used Northland in my life in many ways. I mean, not the exact place, the bricks and mortar, but the people here. We, my wife and I have five children, and four of them came here. <laughs> Who knows why, but they did. And uh, God blessed in their lives, and they're serving the Lord. We have a fifth child. He was rebellious. He went to Clearwater. But... Uh, He's doing well. So it's, it's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, when Matt, and I can call him Matt, okay. uh, when, when Matt asked me about coming to do this, um, it did interest me. Not because I haven't been here in a while, because I was here in July. Uh, but it interested me because, for me, I came to Bible college, not this one, but I came to a Bible college really expecting for things to be made much more clear. And that, in fact, did not happen. <laughs> um, it seemed to me as a young person growing up, um, I had trusted Christ as my Savior as a child, and growing up through uh, most of you, just like you, not exactly all of you, but most of you would be a very similar upbringing. And, and when I looked ahead of me and looking at the young people that they, they seem like much bigger figures when you're 13 or 15 and they're college students, you thought they were really cool. Now you're it. Not so impressed, are you? <laughs> but you're impressed when they're older than you. And, and they seem spiritually to, to be like uh, clear and have it together. They didn't, but it seemed that way to me. And so I was sure that off to Bible college to pursue full-time ministry that it would all become very clear to me. And frankly, the things that were already torturing my soul uh, only tortured it more, frankly, to be honest with you. Because it just seemed about some of the most important questions in my heart, there were only rather broad brush kind of fuzzy answers that were filled with um, cliches. You know, trust the Lord, serve the Lord, a lot, with joy. I need a little more. And um, I, I, want, I want to preface what I say because I can be a little sarcastic, um, just a little. Um, and so in case you don't understand, that's all well intended uh, most of the time. Um, I come from an independent fundamental background. And I, independent fundamental Baptist background. Without apology, that is, that's where I have come from. And, and, and that uh, spiritual nurturing has served me quite well. I don't regret it at all. I worked uh, 25 years together with my dad, who, who started that whole thing for us as a family. <laughs> Uh, being independent, fundamental, separatist, Baptist. And, and uh, we worked together, like I said, for 25 years. And often in that once I had become the senior pastor in the last 15 years that I was a senior pastor, and he was kind of working for me, sort of. Um, he would often ask me, um, son, where, do you, where are you getting this stuff? Who taught you this stuff? And I said, Dad, um, you did. Because what he taught me about God's word and life and truth, um, it was true. And in fact, every generation should stand on the shoulders of the generation before it and not find new truth, because there isn't any new truth, but to further explore and clarify and more, even more courageously seek to obey what God has said and has always said and will always be said by God. God's word doesn't change. And I trust that as our children grow, and they are in their ministry, that they all stand on in, figuratively on our shoulders and, and take God's word even further. Because we can never get it all done. Nobody ever gets it all right, right? So I trust that those who follow us, me, my, my children, and whoever would be influenced in whatever ministry I have, I trust they would, they would, do, they would do better than I've done. Sincerely, that's what you pray for. 
So wh when I make comments about my upbringing or what I've been taught, I want you to understand that that's the framework that I am grateful for it, and I still believe those things. And my life now is just, I'm trying to more consistently, um, more accurately, progressively obey God's word. Progressively complete obedience. Um, I'll die trying. It won't be done. At some point, God will say, that, Tim, that's enough. Good try. <laughs> Get home. Come on. <laughs> so someday that will happen. Um, but in my own pilgrimage, um, there were a number of things, as I was saying, that um, frustrated me because they seemed forever fuzzy. And so hence the, uh, the issue of focus was uh, particularly interesting to me. He says, that's going to be, would you come speak? The answer is, if I can, sure. And then it's like, it's focus week okay so focus and frankly there are a number of things that have been fuzzy that I would like to focus on um, focus in the sense of look at individually target and focus as in take a fuzzy picture and okay how many of you remember old missionary slides okay <laughs> They're kind of like church vans 15 passenger church vans the only people who buy them are cults and churches, okay? <laughs> and the only people your age who know what a slide is are Christians because, because they're missionaries, okay? So, but in, in the old days, the good old Kodak slide projectors, the biggest innovation was autofocus. You could push the button because otherwise you had to twist the thing. But we know the picture comes on, it's like, what's that? And then you twist it or something and it gets clear. Well, that's what um, I would hope God would allow us to do this week. Things that for a long time remain a frustrating, frustratingly fuzzy and unresolved for me. That over the years, just through studying the same word, it's not new truth, it's the old truth, it's the only truth. Studying it a bit more carefully, um, it became a bit clearer to the place that it brought some real uh, improvement, hope, confidence, change into my life. Um, so, as I thought about that, and, 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 and the things in my own life that I thought uh, you would struggle with as well, um, I thought I would not just go back and prepare or select specific messages. Although I have them, I got a briefcase full of them back in the room okay got a couple of them stuck in my bible right here but i actually just don't want to preach them as messages i'd like to talk through certain passages of scripture and just try to clarify some things and and largely they're in this vein of thought there are a lot of things well there's some things that i was told were good things but then when I heard them talked about, they seemed like bad things until I fully, not fully, because they fully understand nothing, but more fully understood them, then they were like, oh, those are great things. For instance, looking forward to the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, most of the time, it's announced you're going to hear a message about the rapture and who's really going and who's really not. How you feeling about that? You're feeling like, oh, great. <laughs> I'll get to ask Jesus to save me again tonight several times before I go to bed, right? It's like... What is so glorious about that? You're probably not going. And if you go, there is that screen in heaven upon which every evil thought you ever had will be shown to all peoples. You want to go? <laughs> we should be looking forward. Maybe you could come tonight. Yay. No, yay, no, no. 
And yet, as written by God, it's intended to be a glorious hope. But frequently, the way we think about it, or it's preached or taught, it is, a, it is an ominous threat. Right? And, and, that, and, 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 and frankly, God didn't screw it up. We do. So that's not what I'm preaching on, so you can be relieved, okay? They're like, oh, no, not that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but something worse we're going to start out with, which is, so let every man examine themselves to see whether they are in the faith. No, not that again. If you ever thought this thought, you, it's like, <laughs> this is later on, it sounds like you might be a redneck. No, you're... Um, if, if, you ever, if you ever had this thought, you can't be saved. And it's like, I didn't have it, but now I just did. I'm damned. Those 7,000 times I asked Jesus Christ to save me didn't work. I thought I meant it at least 700 of those times. But talking about one's assurance of salvation... Are you really a believer? I mean, at first blush, that's like, oh, great. Okay, straight up. How many of you struggle with doubts from time to time? That should be everybody. If it wasn't everybody, somebody's lying. The ones who didn't raise their hand. Okay. You, just, you just define it differently. Okay, you don't struggle. You just have thought about it a couple times. But your superior spiritual life just blotted out those doubts, I'm sure. Okay. How many have struggled with doubts at times very desperately? Did you raise your hand? Not everybody has. Okay, I'm not, not everybody. But it's, it's a problem. And we think that this means something is really terribly wrong with us if we would have such thoughts and, and I can remember as a young person being tortured with such thoughts and, and, and going for help and not, and not getting particularly helpful answer question, uh, answers to my questions like well did you mean it which time um, thought I did I thought I did every time um, do you remember, you know, repent? Oh, man. Did you repent in that uh, order? Oh, you got to believe. You gotta, what do you got to do? Believe first, then repent. Repent first, then believe. Oh, I don't know. I got to do it again. <laughs> there, w there wasn't a lot of help. Or just, or just look. This, how many of this worked for? Okay. Um, okay. Just, okay, just go ahead and pray. If I'm not saved, save me. Anybody like else pray that completely lame prayer? Well intended, but lame. It's interesting to me that this, it's like, it's like some embarrassing secret that, that we have struggled with assurance from time to time that God would so openly deal with it and give us a book of the Bible that was expressly designed to address this issue in the lives of believers. In 1 John, we're going we're gonna to start in chapter 1, but, but we'll flip back to 5.13 where there's the famous verse that talks about what the purpose of the book is. And it's finally we memorize this verse. And typically I can remember, I can remember memorizing the verse and the purpose that I was given to memorize this verse was... So it proves that you can know you're on your way to heaven, that somebody can know, and, and it does, but that's not what the verse is really trying to express. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that, okay? So we're just going to talk through passages, and I'm going to try to stop on time, and, and then we'll pick it up here tomorrow, and then we'll move on through a few subjects through the week, okay? That's my, that's my big plan, really. <laughs> as good as it gets okay okay who's this book written to 
to people who think they might believe. Now, who's it written to? Come on. Believers, like real ones, not phony ones, not fake ones, not supposed ones. God, through John, writes this letter to those who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's who the book is written to, that's who it's for, and that's who God thinks needs it. Right? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that, here's the reason, that you may know that you have eternal life. Notice he doesn't say so that you might have eternal life. Why doesn't he say, I'm writing to this, this to you so that you might have eternal life? Why doesn't he say that? You know this, come on. Because you already have it. If it's a trick question, I'll tell you. Okay, so just go with like, duh, go with that one. Okay, the duh answer is the right one. If it's going to be harder than that, I'll warn you. Okay, the point here is, he doesn't say, I write this to you who believe so that you can have it. They already, they already had it and weren't sure of it. Which makes these people a little bit like you. Right? So he writes to believers who need reassurance. Because we need reassurance. Because lots of stuff goes in on and in and around our lives. In John's day, you had some of the founding men and women of the faith who were dying. And it's like, I thought we were, it's like 1 Thessalonians. It's like, wait a minute, if you follow Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. And now the deacon just died and the pastor's wife just died. And I thought if we believed in Christ, we have eternal life. What's with that? And there was confusion. I mean, key leaders in the Christian church were dying. It was, it was long enough now they were getting old. They just weren't getting killed by his martyrs. They were just falling over dead. They were old. And others were dividing the church with false teaching. And others had, First John's going to deal with this, others had just defected. They were, they were like right next to you, serving the Lord, loving the Lord. And all of a sudden, they just walked away and never came back. That's really... That'll mess with you, won't it? It ever happened to you? I mean, somebody you really thought was really a good Christian, and all of a sudden, they're just like gone. I don't mean like for a walk or for a little stumbling time. They're just gone. That'll mess with you. And then all those battles go on inside your head. That'll really mess with you, won't it? So God knows True believers need to know that they already have eternal life. They have it. You don't need to get it again. But you need reassurance. So what he does through the book of 1 John is speak about the indisputable evidences, things that come along with the Holy Spirit when he indwells you, that are never there without him, that are always there with him. Always. Okay, so it's like, okay, but this could still be scary. It's not supposed to be. Back to 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, John talks about his firsthand knowledge of Christ and his relationship to him. And he speaks about that in verses 1 down through, through verse 2. And then it says, And that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we know that he wrote this letter to them so that these believers might know that they have eternal life. And then John starts out by saying, I'm writing these things to you. This is not a contradiction. It's complementary truth. I'm writing to this so that you can have an ongoing, genuine fellowship with me and with us, and us as John and true believers, and us as Jesus and the Father. 
says, I, I, I'm writing this so that, not so that you can feel bad and feel like you're terrible and a reject and go hide under a rock somewhere. I, I'm writing this to welcome you into a functioning personal relationship, fellowship, friendship with God and Christ and true believers. And I'm writing this to you, look at verse 4, and we are writing these things to you so that you are scared to death. Anybody's translation say that? We are writing these things so that our joy might be complete. Now, joy is one of those hard words to describe. It's like joy. It's like joy. Like being joyful. <laughs> it's like, how do you, how, it's hard. Okay. However, to try to give you an idea, let me just remind you of some of the way this word is used. Because we know it's good. We know it's kind of like happy. It's, it's good. But what's joy feel like? Um, in scripture, it is used of how a farmer would feel at the end of a successful harvest. Season's done. The harvest is in. It's all in the barn. It was a great year. The Bible uses that word joy to describe that event for the non-farmers. Um, the joy at the groom seeing his bride and the bride at her wedding. That's working for all the girls. <laughs> Not so much the guys. I'll go back. I'll be the farmer guy. I'll go to the farmer one. But the girls get that one. It's used to describe the feeling of knowing that the prayer that just got answered was God answering my prayer. Not selfish, but you know, like, well, we all prayed, God answered. You were a nameless face in the crowd saying, me too. Okay. But when there is that very specific prayer, you to God from your soul, and there's no other explanation than he heard you, what's that feel like? If you're a guy, you say, like, good. <laughs> Give me more, okay. Really good. <laughs> but it's joy. It's joy. It's used of uh, the shepherd finding the lost sheep, the woman finding the lost coin, the father finding the lost son. It's used of God towards us when he says at the end of our life, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So, God's telling us up front the reason he wrote First John is so that you can be closer in a more genuine day-to-day -day functioning fellowship with God so that your joy would be full and you would know for sure that you presently and forever possess eternal life. So how would you feel? Besides a little spook, if Jesus Christ himself came down with the one and only Lamb's Book of Life and said this, there's your name right there. Okay, how many of you would want to see it? Come on. I don't want to see it. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Man, wouldn't you want to just like run your finger over that name? Wouldn't you? Be like, you sure that's me? Like there's not a, there's got to be like a bazillion Tim Jordans. Like this was the one, the bald one with the crooked finger, that one. Yeah, there's only one of those. Okay. That's my name. Whoa. Wouldn't that be fist? Wouldn't that be something? That's my name. That would be joy, wouldn't it? So that's his intention in the book. Now, we're not going to study the whole book, but I want to look at a couple key points that I think will help us get a clear picture. All right? So. Clearly we know what he wants us to get from this book. 
now he starts talking about a problem that we have, okay, that we're going to have to deal with. And if we're going to have this joy and assurance, we're going to have to understand we have a problem to deal with. He starts out in verse 5 of chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, literally, but when you do sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He says, here is the deal, believers. Now, remember, he's talking to believers. As believers, we have a sin problem. And we think having a sin problem is a problem. And God's like, uh, knew that already. I mean, understand when I say that it is not a surprise to God that we have a sin problem. He's quite aware of this. Even as believers whose sins have been forgiven and absolutely washed away, the problem is day by day, because we are not completely glorified and fully sanctified, we still sin. And here's the problem. We want to have fellowship with God, but God is light in him, is no darkness at all, and then there's us. So if we walk in the light as he is, like we have fellowship, but like, thank you very much, like I can do that. I can for like a second. Until I start thinking, hey, I'm pretty good. Pride, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> that was a short walk. <laughs> so it gets very real of saying, here's the deal. God is working and providing a way that you and I deal with our sin problem. And in our lifetime, that will not include eradicating it solving it so that it goes away. It will be a part of our life until you see Christ. And, and understand when I say this, that's not a problem to God like, oh, what am I going to do about it? Like, he, 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 know, he knows. He knows. And in his gracious kindness, even for his children, he provides a way for us to deal with this ongoing struggle with sin that is not going to go away till you're dead. So he says, here's the deal. Don't say you don't have it. Or you're lying and you're calling God a liar. You're going to have to be willing to engage God's plan to get along with the holy God, which is if we keep on confessing our sins. He is faithful and just to keep on forgiving us our sins and to keep on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. So if we keep on confessing, he is faithful just to keep on forgiving and to keep on cleansing. So what does that say about us and our sin? What does it say about you and your sin? Something real simple. Go for the simple. Go for the tough. Okay, I'm going to go for this one more time. There will be a test at the end if we keep on confessing our sin. Why would we, why would we do that? Because we keep on sinning. Something's wrong with me, I keep on sinning. You're breathing. You're born a sinner and you're breathing. That's why you're keeping on sinning. And, and, and he doesn't make light of it. He talks about the great price he paid for our sin. But he says, here's the real deal in our lifetime. There is no prayer you can pray. There's no spiritual discipline you can accomplish that will keep you clean. You've already been washed clean by the blood of Christ. You will stand before God dressed in Christ's righteousness that's great. It is great, but it's but today I'm still me. 
And there is, it is impossible to stay clean. I don't care who you are. I don't care what spiritual disciplines you go through. I don't care you put yourself in a box. You just locked the trouble in. Because every man is tempted when he is drawn away of what? His own lust. You just locked them in the box with you. You can't stay clean. It's, it's not an option. You'd be like, we could, I can't do that. You'd be like, okay, here's the plan. Jordan, uh, you're going to have to uh, grow hair and jam a basketball on a regulation rim. Uh, two strikes. Neither of them. <laughs> if, that, if that's the plan, it's not going to work. Can't do either. Maybe on a six-foot rim... Over a third grader, I think I can jam on that guy and the hair just in my ears, in my nose. That's it anymore. Okay. It's not like I don't do it, because uh, I, I could, but I'm just holding back. It just, I can't. Okay. So me stay clean, can't do that. You can't do that. Something's wrong with you, I can't stay clean. You're living. But how do people, how do people, think with me, think simple again. How do people appear? And I don't mean like, uh, out, you know, false appearances. But how do people at least appear to be clean most of the time? How do you appear to be clean? Do you stay clean? Think simply. Because how, how, most of you, I'm, I haven't been close enough to smell you. Um, but probably with most of you, if I were standing next to you, you would appear to be clean and at least from a distance smell like you were clean. Okay. Why is that? That's probably true about most of you, not everybody, most of you every day. So the shower you took when you're 12 still working for you? Is it? So how do you stay clean? You don't stay clean, but how do you appear to stay clean? How do you functionally Stay clean. You keep getting clean. It's like a big duh, right? A big duh. It works for you every day, hence the showers. So what he's saying is, here's the deal. We got a problem. Problem is, God's light, we're not. We're forgiven. We will be just like Christ. But living here, we got a problem. God says, here's the deal. You've got to be willing to every day of your life engage your sin problem by owning your sin and asking for forgiveness again. Don't you love it when it's, hey God, it's me, it's again, and it's, and it's not a new one? Because how many sins are there? I don't know. I haven't tried them all. <laughs> I haven't counted either. I don't know, but I know... I know you got to repeat. There's only so many. Right? But don't you love it when it's, it's me again and it's this again? Don't you feel particularly dirty? God says, look, I already told you you can't stay clean. And if you say you can, you're a liar. And then if you say, no, I really can, you're calling me a liar. Those are two more sins. But here's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be day by day committed to an ongoing practice of getting clean. And that happens in many ways. The influence of God's word and spiritual fellowship or many things. But the one he mentions is here is every day owning my sin. Confessing my sin. Um, I was going to go further tonight but I'm going to stay here for a little bit and we'll pick it up here tomorrow morning um, confess confessing sin so what's with that what's confess um, here, this is the silliest illustration that I, I that I can come up with I don't know why that's a goal <laughs> but apparently it is um, but it's one that comes to my mind so say I come to visit you at your house that would be weird for you, I know. Uh, but I come to your house, some strange reason, I come to your house. Uh, and I walk in, I sit down, and, you know, whoever's there, mom's there, dad's there, whoever's there. 
and mom says, okay, hey, I sit here in the living room, and uh, you want something to drink? Sure. Uh, you want some coffee? Sure. Why not? Okay, I'll get you the coffee. She goes out there to get the coffee. I'm sitting in your living room, and on, on the end table there by your, your little chair or your sofa is like this, uh, this knick-knacky thing, figurine thing, you know, probably came from a missions trip or something like that, some thingy there. Okay, you know what I mean? Anybody, y'all look kind of puzzled right now. Anybody know what a figurine is or a knickknack? Okay, come on. Okay. So it's, it's there and it's got a head. <laughs> okay. It's a person kind of, sort of. So I'm waiting for the coffee. I pick it up because I want to see it. And while I'm admiring it, the head comes off. It's like, oh man. I won't say what would come to my mind. I was going to say, oh, man. Okay. <laughs> oh, rats! <laughs> the head came off. <laughs> okay. So, now you got the figurine. Now you got the head. You can hear it coming with the coffee. So, you got two choices. One is, put the figurine back there. Balance the head. <laughs> right back on there. Right? Because you can't tell yet. Because it didn't like chip all up, but just a nice clean break. So now it's sitting there. There it is. She comes in, puts the coffee on the table, bumps the table, head falls off. You go, whoa, what happened? <laughs> wow, that's some strong coffee. Whoa. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what we like to do, right? I would like to, I mean, it's like, but confess is, uh, I did this. Uh, really, it is. It's like this, 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 this wasn't like this. When you left, I picked it up. No, I didn't try to break the head off. But no excuses, but if you, bought, if you didn't buy such cheap stuff, okay, that's not going to work. Confess is, I did it. I'm sorry, please forgive me. No excuse. No promise. And if you put another one here, I promise I won't touch it. <laughs> no, that's not confess. That might be a smart thing to do, but that's not confess. Confess is, no excuse, no minimizing, just straight up, I did this. No penance, and I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll give you money, or do that. No, I did this. Please forgive me. So, you and I, every day of our lives, confessing our sin seems to be like, really? That's as, this is it? That's as good as it gets? This is what it's supposed to be? I think God wants better than this. I think, I, I think God wants something different than this. I think the last book I read and preached or I heard said something different than this. But Jesus is saying to his children, as we wrestle with our sin, because we're going to develop this further tomorrow, but the, I, I believe the biggest source of doubt is, is our, our heartbreak and our frustration with our sin, right? I mean, that's what makes you most worried about you, is your perpetual struggle with sin. And we're just scratching the surface tonight, but what he's saying is this perpetual struggle with sin The struggling part is God's will. Not the caving in part, that's us, okay? But the struggling with it, the not denying it, not laying down, rolling around in it, and, and giving ourselves to it, which that's what we're going to get tomorrow, which we can't do. No, it's, he, he, later on, he doesn't say, you're not allowed to live in it. He's saying, I'm just telling you straight up, you can't. You can, you can try. You have tried. And you just can't do it. 
you can do any sin, but you just can't say, that's what I'm going to do, <coughs> forget God, forget you, I'm going to live and that's the way it's going to be, see you later, turn the page, no more God in my life. The Holy Spirit's in, he's like, ah, uh, wait a minute, buddy, you're going nowhere, because I'm going nowhere, and I'm going to convince you of your sin, and you can't stop sinning, but you can continue to own it without excuse on a regular basis. You can continue to get clean every day, and may, that may not please you, and it may not please the people around you, but God says it pleases me. Because whether you believe it or not or want to admit it or not, God's saying, I know you. That's the best you can do. And in doing that, you're going to grow. In all the spiritual disciplines, you're going to grow, but you're never going to get better than in your entire life than on a day-by-day -day basis to the day you died, to the day the Apostle Paul died, he was continuing, he was keep on confessing his sins keeping on confessing his sins and Jesus kept on forgiving him of his sins and kept on cleansing him from all unrighteousness and the same with John when he was an old man on the Isle of Patmos it never goes it's gonna never goes away it never disappears we're never done this 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 battle we have to deal with our sin it distresses us it pleases Christ. So, you struggling with your sin every day may seem to you to be like something's irreparably wrong with me. But understand how we say this. You get to chapter 2 and he, and, and he, and he talks to us in very um, endearing terms. Verse 1, my little children... I am writing these things to you so that you don't sin. I'm not telling you this thing about continuing to confess your sin so that you can just live in sin because you won't be able to do that anyhow as a child of God. But I'm writing to you that you don't sin, but when you do, you have a lawyer, and that lawyer is Jesus Christ, and he's the one who already paid for all your sins. And then he says this in verse 3. We didn't read this far yet because this is where I was going to go and this is where we'll go in the morning and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments okay does anybody say now that's a little confusing okay because it is it's i mean ultimately it's not it'll make sense but on face value harry's saying okay you're going to keep don't say you don't sin call me a liar and you're a liar you're going to have to keep on confessing your sins and I'm writing to these things things to you so you don't sin but when you do we have an advocate and then he says but here's how you can know and, and, and the word that he uses here is you can be sure that you have come to know him and, and the idea there in the, the uh, time embedded in the grammar there is you've come to know him in the past you know him now and you will forever know him it wasn't true, but you came to know him, you know him now, and you will forever know him. So how can I know that I've come to know him? That's the whole thing there, right there. How can I know that I've come to know him? He says, if you keep his commandments, but you just told me I can't. Thanks, God. Well, obviously, we need to understand that a little bit better. But for tonight, you need to remember this. That as we study this tomorrow, it'll probably take us tomorrow morning and tomorrow night to do this. Um, thinking now, um, we won't do it for us the week. We'll just do it tomorrow. Um, God's writing this to you who believe, and He wants you to know that even though this might confuse you a little bit from time to time, because He's going to really get down to the nitty gritty of it all, He wants you to know up front it's not to scare you. He's not trying to show you you're not really a Christian. Now, it may be an unbeliever could hear this and it could be clear to them they're not really a Christian. That could happen. But that's not the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is you who are believers so that you can know. 
and you can have fellowship and your joy can be full. So yes, we have a problem with sin, even as believers. That does not make you unique. That doesn't make you better than or worse than any believer in all of Scripture or in the room. Yes, we have a problem. And God has provided for that problem by grace, forgiveness of sins on a day-to-day basis. And even though that's true about me, that I have to keep on confessing my sins, he can still tell me, who has to keep on confessing my sins, that I can know for sure that I've come to know him because I keep his commandments. And that doesn't seem to go together, does it? But it does. So that's for tomorrow. You'll have to come back. All right, let's pray together. I'm going to close in prayer and then uh, the leaders here can do what they want to do at the end of everything. But when I pray, if, if you want to slip out and go pray alone somewhere, you can do that. If you want to go grab a friend or one of the professors, teachers, workers here, and if you have some questions, you can do that. Um, something else, why... Heads bowed and eyes closed doesn't mean don't listen. Okay, and you can peek; you won't go to hell. Um, well, maybe, but probably not. Okay, okay. But listen to me, okay? Um, through the week, heads bowed, eyes closed. Come on. Through the week, um, I'll be hanging around. I got no place else to go. Um, and sometimes I'll need to go do something else that you'll know I'm hiding because you won't find me. But whenever you see me bopping around, uh, I'm fair game. If you want to just get together and talk for a bit, I promise you I'll give you the time unless somebody else, you've got to go meet somebody else. But if you don't feel uh, reluctant just to approach me during the week and sit down and talk for a while, I'll be happy to do that with you, all right? If you want to go pray alone or pray with somebody, you do that when I close in prayer. This is just kind of getting our hearts and minds set for the week together, and I trust that God will encourage you. I trust that he has your attention tonight. Father, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your intention to give us a sense of genuine friendship and fellowship with you and complete joy in knowing that we have eternal life. Even though we have a sin problem, we have eternal life. And I pray, Lord, you'd lead us all through this together, especially tomorrow as we get more specific with some of these things, that you just really clarify some fuzzy things that have been annoying us and torturing us and confusing us for a long time. I pray, Lord, that all of us in the next 24 hours who believe in you would be fully confident with great joy that we have eternal life. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The thing we have to remember in eternity past when our plan of redemption was planned and then the incarnate son came lived the sinless life got to the garden of gethsemane knowing what was coming requested the help of his friends so pressed god sent an angel uh, to bring comfort probably michael Because Christ, the incarnate Son, knew he was going to be separated from his Father, and he was going to bear the full wrath of the Father for my sin and your sin. And he cried, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Took the cross and fell underneath the load, and the mockers came. They spit on him, punched him, pulled out his beard, nailed to the cross. If you're who you say you are, come down. The world goes dark. The light of the world is out. Three hours from three in the afternoon till six. The infinite one in a finite period of time was paying our infinite penalty. And the sin penalty was once and for all settled. It was gone. The condemnation for hell, that price was paid and he bore the full wrath of God the Father in that finite period of time. So that when we come to belief, and this is what Dr. Jordan is talking about, to those who believe that that sin issue is forever settled. You will never again face the sin problem when you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat. The sin is gone. Now that day-to-day -day sin that he was talking about is what needs that continual confessing and that continual cleansing that could separate us from our fellowship and intimacy with him and keep us from enjoying the full joy that he has intended for us. And as <clears throat> will be dealt with this week, the question is that question of belief. And you might struggle with that. Was there a time when that really took place? And many of you have wrestled and doubted and confessed, as he said many, many times over. I went through my whole teen years <clears throat> having gone forward with a group and never dealt with one-on-one -on -one and it was kind of mushy in my thinking. But my pride got to a point where I would not acknowledge that I was confused. But one thing we have to settle, it's not did I do it right, is did he do it right? And what joy we can experience, not only this week, but in our semester, in our entire lives, getting the freedom that comes through knowing and through accepting that full uh, gift of eternal life. And then the sensitivity in our hearts to be obedient to his word. As we mentioned this morning, when the word is given, our hearts respond. This is no effort to perfect ourselves in the flesh. There is no performance that we can do to, to make us perfect in the flesh, to sanctify us in the flesh. We cannot perform. We have to rest and work in that word. That word is, needs to be put into us. So let's be attentive this week. Lord, what will you have for me? And, and if you are wrestling with the initial problem of belief. Then you come to one of us. Dr. Jordan is going to be free. He'll be in the grind. He'll be on campus. He'll be in the dining hall. He'll be available. Don't carry this thing. And don't go in agony of your soul when the freedom has already been, been offered and has already been given. And when Christ said, it is finished, that work was done. And so, as we uh, go, I'm just going to have us bow our heads briefly, and then we will lift our heads and be dismissed. But if any of you right now would say, Les, I, I have wrestled all my life. I, I came here not knowing how I stand with God. But you said, I, I want that load lifted tonight so that I can really take that step of faith in the finished work of Christ. And I would really like to have 
that issue of that anchor point settled once and for all in my heart. Because you might say, I, I don't know that I ever really understood. And I've been struggling to work for that acceptance. I'll just take 30 seconds. If anyone needs to slip out, you feel free to go. One of our faculty or staff will, will go with you and pray. If not, we'll be available throughout this whole week. We'll be praying for God to show himself mighty on our behalf this week. Father, we thank you so much for the word, the simplicity of the word, the clarity of its presentation tonight. May our hearts be blessed. May we be lifted to you in praise, adoration for the work that was done on our behalf, that sin penalty forever settled. Give us the strength for the work we have to do this week in classes, the projects. But Father, let us not get so busy that we overlook the simplicity of your truth and the joy that you intend for us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, have a good evening. <clears throat>